Okay, let's start. Today we will talk about uh, performance and the power consumption. Um, I have already posted a uh, project one on Canvas, which is about uh, the Sambi language. Um, you will be required to um, implement a uh, insert insertion sort um, by the a Zambi language, um, the program needs to be um, executable in the tiny risk simulator. Um, basically, the the program is very simple. It just uh, do the insertion sort among four integer. Uh, you need to implement uh, uh, some assembly codes to uh, first, uh, write those integer to the memory location, um, and then do the insertion sort, and then write store the data uh, result, the sorted sequence, uh, to the memory. If you have any question, you can you can email me. Today we will talk about the um, power and uh, performance. So the power and the performance are very important metric metrics uh, for the state of the art computer system, including uh, your laptop servers, uh, the servers on the in the cloud, or even your mobile phone. Uh, because people nowadays pay more attention on the performance per watt, not necessarily the absolute value of performance. Um, but we also consider the power consumption a lot nowadays. So the first problem in computer organization, all the computer organize, all computer architecture is that I have very fancy technique, architecture technique, which potentially can accelerate a, a part of your computer um, a lot even a lot um, but the question is uh, whether uh, i need to implement this fancy technique into your current computer system um, so this equation can help you to answer that question um, the speed up is actually equals to the time execution time without your fancy technique divided by the execution time with your fancy technique. Um, this equation is a so-called Amdaha's law. Amdaha's law is the most significant equation in computer architecture. It's very simple. Assume that um, your technique can speed up uh, a fra uh, fraction f of a task by a factor of uh, s. So the new execution time um, will be equal to the original execution time, which is the execution time without your technique. Multiply one minus yes. Okay, so the, um, the new execution time is a, will be equal to the, um, the baseline execution time will multiply one minus F plus F divided by S. So what does this portion mean? Um, basically, no technique can accelerate uh, 
your program, all the component of your program. Um, for example, um, if you implement a very good, uh, much better or much better floating point unit, this floating point unit can only help uh, with the application with uh, floating point operations. If your if your program have one hundred percent integer operation has no floating point operation at all, then basically this fancy floating point unit cannot help you. So this is why um, you know a technique can only help a fraction of your task or your application. So one minus this fraction means the portion which cannot be helped by your technique or by your design. This is the portion of uh, your application or your program or your task which cannot be helped by your design. And uh, this part is the new uh, fraction of, you know, uh, that, that fraction which can actually be helped by your uh, design. So when we sum these two together, this is the new time, execution time. And then we need to multiply the original uh, baseline time. So we can use this new time divided by the, we can use the original T original time divided by the the time new f is the fraction of the program which can actually be helped by your design for example, you have an application, 40%, 40% are floating point operations, 6% are integer operations. You design a new or much better floating point unit, and this unit can help that 40% floating point operation a lot. So this F is actually the 40%. So I will give you a figure to explain this, this issue. So assume this is the original execution time and this is your program. We have a 100% execution time here, which is a equals to one, 100% equals to one. And uh, you have a fraction F, floating point operation. So these, these are the floating point operations. And you have one minus, 100% minus F, which is the integer operation. These are the integer operations. So from this figure, from this time, from this ratio, we can see that. Uh, so most operation are floating point operations. If you have a floating new floating point unit, of course this unit can help you program a lot. Assume your unit can reduce the execution time of this um, floating point unit uh, floating point operation by a factor of s. So this is the new execution time of your floating point operations. Uh, compared to the old one, this is the old one, this is the new one. Your technique or your design can improve it by a factor of s. But for the rest operation, for the for the other operation like the integer operation, your design cannot help them at all. So the time are the same. You can see these two portions are the same. Yes, you are right. 
the fraction of running time that that is uh, influenced by in this case is the floating point numbers or floating point operations. So you can see the integer part are not influenced by the new floating point unit. So the execution time for these operations are the same. So when you use this part plus the new execution time of your floating point operations, then this is a new time. So the speed up is equals to this original time divided by the new time. Because the original time is larger, so the speed up must be larger than one. And there, here is another example. If your floating point operation only occupy, let's say 10% or 20% of your application, this is the F. And the most of your application are integer operation. So in this case, if you have a new floating point unit, you can only improve this one by a factor of s. This is the new floating point execution time. And when you use the integer time plus the floating point new time, new floating point time, this is your new uh, execution time. Then you also need to use the time original divided by the time new. You will get another um, speed up. So the question is, uh, which one is better? Of course, the first case is better because the bottleneck of the first case is the floating point unit. Why? Because most of the operation, 80% or 90% of your operation is floating point operation in the first example. But in the second example, your most uh, operation are the integer, integer operation. So it's pointless to have a fancy or more advanced floating point unit in this case. Although it can still give you a you know, very small speed up, but uh, your design, your new design may introduce a lot of overhead. So it may not you know, be a good idea to have a such design in in this, in the second case. So the Amdaha's law can help you to calculate a speed up. Amdaha's law can help you to evaluate whether a design, um, you know, is a good idea, whether it's a good idea to have a new design in the current system. The main idea of the Amdahas law is that if you want to achieve a very large speed up, you must attack the bottleneck. Well, it's not about hardware or software. It's about the bottleneck, identify the bottleneck, even for your software. Um, the, the example I provided is about hardware. It's about a floating point a hardware unit. Um, for your software, they are the same. If your application includes a, a two kernels, one kernel do the sorting, the other kernel do the printing. If the sorting kernel occupy maybe 80% execution time, then it's, very, it's a very good idea to you know, modify your sorting algorithm to make it run faster so that the, you know, the overall application, overall execution time will be reduced significantly. But if your sorting is only a very lightweight operation, most of your operation in your application is actually do the printing, then improving the you know, sorting algorithm is not a good idea. Because even you improve it by 
1,000 times, your total execution time will not be significantly reduced. It's not about software or hardware. It's about it's about a bottleneck, identified bottleneck. But in this class, we emphasize on the on the hardware part. Here is another equation to evaluate the performance of a processor or, or a CPU. So the average execution time is equal to the total time of maybe you have uh, five programs, five applications. You run them sequentially. You record the total execution time. And you also record the program number. In this case, this is five. And you, um, it equals to, um, you know, instruction number. Program divided by the program number, and uh, cycles. How many cycles? Um, the total cycle number of these uh, programs, and the instruction per cycle. And uh, and multiply the time and the cycle here. So this part is uh, the average instruction number per program. So how on average how many instructions do you have in one program? This part is the cycle per instruction, the average cycle number per instruction. We call it a cycle per instruction. The inverse of this value is the instruction per cycle. The, uh, the time uh, divided by the cycle is the inversion of the frequency. This is the time, uh, this is cycle means the time of uh, one single cycle. Um, time divided by the cycle is actually the frequency. So we, we just broke, we just broke this part into three different pieces. This part, on average, how many instructions do your program have? Do, do one of your program have? So the instruction number can be improved by your compiler, by your instruction set architecture. You know, if you use GCC to compile some um, code, it may give you 1,000 instructions. If you use a uh, some compiler from Intel, it may only give you 800 instructions. So choosing a uh, compiler which can, choosing a compiler is very important, uh, you know, to reduce the total instruction number here. No, it's not, uh, it's not about the cache, it's about the instruction number. So here we didn't uh, consider any cache um, or memory. It's just a CPU. So the average instruction number per application or per program is the, uh, the job you need to do. The CPI or the IPC is the, you know, the hardware metric, performance metric. Some machine can achieve very high um, IPC, instruction per cycle. So it can execute maybe five instruction each cycle, but some 
architecture can only execute maybe only one instruction per cycle. So in the same way, the cycle per instruction are totally different, which is uh, uh, one divided by five. If you computer can execute uh, five instruction per cycle, the CPI, the cycle per instruction is uh, one divided by five. So if you computer can only execute uh, one cycle per instruction, uh, per cycle, the, the CPI is a one, one divided by one. So different uh, CPU, different microarchitecture will give you different performance on this part. The last one is about uh, process technique. If you use a uh, more advanced uh, process technology, your frequency may be higher. So the, you know, when you try to evaluate a uh, CPU performance, the performance of a CPU, the software, the co computer architecture, the device performance, all these three parts will give you a huge impact on the final performance here. But in this lecture, we only focus on this part, the CPI or the IPC. We assume we use the same compiler. We just, so we assume we use the same algorithm, the same compiler, the same software part. And we also assume we have the same frequency. Uh, the device level part are also the same. So we talk about the performance a lot. Actually, the performance includes two parts. The first one is the latency, the execution time. Time to finish uh, an application or one task. The other one is the throughput, the bandwidth, number of tasks we can run per unit time. So the throughput uh, can explore the parallelism, but the latency cannot. Sometimes they are complementary, but sometimes they have conflicts. Uh, sometimes you can achieve a short latency and high throughput uh, simultaneously, but sometimes if you want to achieve a shorter latency, you have to sacrifice the throughput. Or if you want to achieve a larger throughput, you have to prolong your latency. So here is one example, um, how to move four people from A to B, A place, A place to B place. Uh, the distance between A place and the B place are 10 miles. Um, you have a two option. The first option is a car. The capacity is five, speed is a 60. Bus capacity is a 60, the speed is a 20 miles per hour. So the latency of car is a 10 minutes. Bus is a 30 minutes. How, how did you get this 10 minutes? How did you get this latency? This latency is uh, equals to 10 miles, which is the total distance. Divided by 60 mile per hour. Then you have a one divided by six hour. So one hour has a 60 minutes. So this is 10 minutes. In the same way you can get a bus latency which 10 miles divided by the 20 um, miles per hour. The result is a uh, 0.5 hour. 0.5 hour is a uh, 30 minutes. The throughput of car is a uh, 10 uh, person per 
hour. And the bus is a 60 person per hour. I'm sorry. Uh, this person per hour is actually contains the, you know, return trip. Uh, trip. For example, um, although the latency of the bus is a uh, thirty minutes, um, in order in order to go to B from A, the bus also need to return from uh, um, from B to A. Uh, so the whole trip for the bus is a uh, 60 minute, 60 minutes, which is uh, one hour. Uh, in during this hour, the bus can only help uh, 60 person. So this is 60. So the latency of the car is uh, 20 minutes. So for a round trip, the car need uh, 20 minutes. So for one, one hour, it can go three round trips. Each round trip, it can help five people. So this is a 15. Then from the latency perspective, the car is better because the latency of car is shorter. But for the, from the throughput perspective, the bus is better because the throughput of the bus is larger. Any question? about this. So you can consider your car is your um, high performance CPU. It runs at a very high frequency, but it has a limited number of cores. It may only have eight cores or four cores. So concurrently, you can run maybe only eight or four threads on this CPU. But on the bus, the bus is a is a, a kind of a GPU. You know, uh, each car may only run at eight hundred megahertz. Your CPU can easily run to G hertz, gigahertz. Uh, your your GPU can only run maybe five five hundred megahertz or eight hundred megahertz. But it has thousands of cores. So the throughput uh, will be very high, but the latency of GPU is not good. So the performance improvement uh, can be described in different ways. Uh, for example, the processor A is uh, X times faster than processor CPU B if the latency of A um, is equal to the latency of B divided by the X, or the throughput of A equals to the throughput of B multiply X. Uh, we didn't consider the intercore latency. We didn't consider any communication between the cars. We just assume uh, your task is a fully parallel, parallel. Um, you can easily distribute your task on the on the CPU. We we, we haven't discussed, uh, you know, the complicated details. Uh, now these are just an example to help you understand the difference between throughput and latency. So when we when we say a, a CPU is a faster, either the latency is a shorter or the throughput is a larger. The CPU, the CPU A is uh, X percent faster than CPU B if the latency is, uh, you know, the latency of A is equal to the equal to the latency of B divided by one plus X divided by one hundred percent by one hundred, and the throughput equals to the throughput of B multiply one plus X divided by the um, one hundred. So back to the purest slide, uh, purest example. The car is uh, three times faster than the bus. Um, the bus is uh, four times faster than the car.
from the latency perspective, the car is three times faster than bus. From the throughput perspective, the bus is four times faster than the car. So when we talk about faster, we need to also give whether we compare latency or the throughput. And uh, here is one problem on the performance improvement. So I give you two configurations. Um, which CPU is better? One configuration is for one CPU. So CPU A has a CPI as two, and a fr frequency is a 2.8 gigahertz. CPU B has a CPI as one, the clock is uh, 1.8. One point eight G hertz, of course. The, uh, we assume we have the same uh, ISA instruction set. We had the same uh, compiler. So which CPU is better? If you, you know, nowadays if you. Use if you read some other advertisement, they always tell you the frequency. For example, we I have uh, you know assume the car number are the same. We only have one car. Um, I have a two point eight G CPU. Yes, but unfortunately, the frequency doesn't tell you all the stuff. Um, when you, in order to solve that problem, you need to remember this equation. So the, you know, the, the extrusion time is actually equals to, you know, the product of these three parts. Uh, we assume we have the same compiler. So this part, this part are the same. We assume we have the same processor. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, process technology. The, uh, so. The, 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 process the process technology is not a problem. So in that example, we have a different CPI. This part are different. We have different frequency. This part has a difference. Um, although we have the same uh, compiler, so this part are the same. The first part are the same, but uh, we have uh, two different uh, parts on the CPI and the frequency. So we, in order to execute the performance, the A performance equals to, we need to use a cycle per instruction, which is the inverse of the CPI, multiply the frequency. The B is a inverse of the CPI, multiply the frequency. So the value of B is 1.8. The value of A is 1.4. If you only evaluate them by the frequency, then of course A is faster. But when you consider the absolute latency of a program running on both processor or CPUs, then the B is faster. So we have one real life case uh, on this, um, which is a printing three. It's actually faster than printing four. The printing four use a lot of uh, deep pipeline. Um, as a result, uh, the CPI of the printing four is not uh, actually very large. The, I'm sorry, the CPI, the cycle per instruction of a printing four is very large. The IPC, the instruction per cycle of printing four is not a very large. Uh, although the printing four can run at a faster 
frequency at a higher frequency, the absolute performance of printing flow is actually not good. So this is a real life example. But again, uh, when Intel <laughs> concurrently sell, sell, was selling these two, people always buy printing flow. So we can add the latency together if two tasks are sequential, sequentially executed. But we cannot add a throughput. So assume that we have uh, we 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 need to run uh, three hundred and uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, three hundred and sixty miles. The first half we run at this speed, the second half we run this speed. Then we can add the latency of the first half and the latency of the second half together as the total latency. But we cannot do that uh, for the throughput. For the throughput, we need to recalculate that. So, for example, we run this speed for six, the first six hours. We run this speed for the second, uh, for the um, the rest of two hours. The second two hours. Um, so, what's the speed? The throughput here is actually the speed. We cannot simply add these two uh, speeds together and divide it by two. If we do that, we get this, this 60 miles. Not uh, 30 plus 90 divided by two, which is a 60. This is not a correct answer. We need to use the, distance, the total distance divided by the, um, the total time. The total time is a 60, six hour plus two hour, eight hour here. The total distance is a six hour multiply 30 plus uh, two multiply 90. Which is a 360 divided by the total latency, which is the eight hours. So this is the 45 is the throughput. So we cannot simply add two throughput together. So to evaluate the performance of one CPU, we cannot only run one benchmark. We need to run multiple benchmarks. Then when we have the performance of uh, multiple benchmarks, we need to present some a kind of uh, average you know, performance value. Uh, we have uh, three different options. The first one is uh, arithmetic average. Second is uh, harmonic and geometric uh, uh, harmonics. We have a different uh, geometric average. We have a uh, three different average uh, you know, um, metric to describe the average performance. So why we do, why do we need a three <laughs> instead of only one? Because they, they can be used in different scenarios. Uh, for example, the arithmetic, people always, you know, prefer the arithmetic average. But sometimes the arithmetic, uh, you know, average can can tell you nothing. Um, if I calculate the salary, average salary, in this classroom, in this Zoom classroom, um, probably the average salary means something. But if I want to calculate, um, the salary between you and uh, Bill Gates, Bill Gates or Stephen Jobs, 
uh, we will get a very large number, but that uh, large number me is meaningless to you because probably the total, um, you know, the total salary is actually the salary of Bill Gates. So in that case, we prefer this genomic average metric. So this metric can give you a better idea of the average value when you know the variation among um, you know the, the members are very significant. Um, in the computer architecture case, uh, we typically use the arithmetic to describe latency. Harmonic describes the throughput. And when we talk about a speed up, we uh, use the gen gen genomic uh, average value. Why? Because potentially if you uh, propose some new hardware design, your hardware design may only works for some a, a portion of the benchmark. If your technique can significantly improve those technique, uh, those applications, those benchmarks, but have basically no influence to the rest of the benchmarks. If you use the arithmetic average, then the value the average value may not be accurate. You may overemphasize the importance of your uh, design. So using the genomic average value may describe your throughput, of, uh, I'm sorry, the speed up better. And the computer, there are very, uh, very important locality concept in the computer architecture area. The first one is our uh, temporal locality. So if you use something, now it's very likely that you will look, you will use it again very soon. If you uh, he, here is the here is the same. If you look up the something, now uh, it's very likely you will look it up again soon. Locality means if you look up uh, something, if you look something up, uh, it's very likely you will look up uh, something nearby soon. If you need uh, a variable A, you will need uh, the variable A plus one or A minus one very soon. A means the address. The temporal means if you, you use A now, potentially you will use A again very soon. So one is the temporal locality. The second one is a spatial locality. And then the power. The power described uh, in the unit of volt. Um, we need a power. We need to consider a lot on the power consumption because we have a limited battery lifetime. The power can be broken into uh, the dynamic power and uh, static power. The static power means whether you run an application or not on your computer, you still need to pay the static power. After you turn your computer on, you need to pay the static power. But if you run a lot of application on your computer, then you you pay more dynamic power. If you don't run any application on your computer, you don't pay any dynamic power. So that's the difference. So the energy is the power multiplied time. The unit, uh, the joule, is the joule. And the power and uh, energy are two different concepts. Uh, for example, there is a one, also one example. We have two approach to finish the same goal. Um, approach one require very high power consumption, but uh, it, uh, 
may finish that uh, task or application or that goal earlier than the second one. The second one consume a smaller power, a smaller power, but it require a longer time. So from the power perspective, of course, the first approach has larger power consumption because you can see the power here. Um, but from the energy perspective, you have to do the calculation here. You have to calculate the area of this, this part. So the second one may not have a smaller energy consumption. When you sum them together, you know, this part and this part together, probably the second one is uh, equals to, is equal to the first approach. The second approach is first, is the same as the first approach, or maybe even larger. So again, when we talk about energy and power consumption, you need to distinguish them. They are not the same. So we pay more and more money to support some data center because of the power consumption. And uh, because of the power consumption, the electricity utility is only a part of the consumption. The other consumption is uh, because the power will generate heat, we also need to pay cooling in the data center. So reducing power consumption is very important. Again, the power can be grouped into static power and a dynamic power. When you actually do some calculation, you pay the dynamic power. Otherwise, you only pay the static power. So when you open the, the switch, the transistor is similar to the switch. We have some current that goes through this switch. So the dynamic power is actually proportional to the C, the capacitance, and the VDD square, supply voltage and the active factor, the frequency, switching frequency, and the frequency. Um, so the active factor means the average fraction of transistor switching. And uh, the, of course, the frequency. You can see that the dynamic power occupy maybe 50% to 70% of the total power consumption. The static power means even you close your switch, some leakage will also go through your gate. So no matter you use your computer or not, you are paid the leakage power. The leakage power is only proportional to the VDD. So from these two equations, we can see that reducing the VDD is very important. How can you do that? By having more advanced process technology, you can do, have that from a 10 nanometer to five nanometer, the VDD is reduced. Although nowadays it's really, it's you know, become more and more difficult to reduce VDD, but the VDD is still reducing from uh, old process technology to new process technology. The leakage is also proportional to the temperature. So we have a positive feedback loop in the leakage power that potentially can melt your chip. Why? Because the larger power consumption you have, the more heat you need to handle. The more heat you have, the higher temperature you have. And the higher temperature will increase the leakage power consumption. So this is a positive feedback loop 
So it's difficult to reduce the power consumption. And based on the equation, you have a different method to reduce the power consumption. Either you reduce the frequency or you reduce the VDD or even you can reduce the active factor. You use the computer less. These three methods can, both of them, uh, these three methods, all of them can help you to reduce the power consumption. So nowadays it's become more and more difficult to reduce the VDD. Even you have a more advanced technology node. So here is some typical power consumption for Intel CPU. Um, the first, uh, you know, the first three eighty-six only consume two volt. Nowadays it's a one hundred and thirty volt. So this is the frequency. Can you further improve the frequency, in increase this frequency? Probably not. Otherwise, you know, um, your chip mal will melt down. This is so-called a power wall. Because of, uh, because of the power consumption, you cannot further increase the frequency. But how the company sell you new CPU? They increase the call number. Otherwise, you can you will not buy the new CPU, right? So we have a different method to reduce the power consumption. The first one is the power gating. The power gating means you add an enable signal here. If you use the, if you want to use the uh, function, you set the enable as one then the function unit will be driven by this clock. So this is an AND gate. Um, any number and one is that any number. So the clock and one is the clock itself. No matter the clock is a zero or not, if, you, if we use the clock and the one, then it's the clock itself. Otherwise, if we do not use this function, do not want to use the clock function, uh, your function unit, we just set the enable as a zero. Anything and a zero, which is also a zero. So we will shut this um, function unit down forever. This is so-called a clock gating. The second one is a power gating. Power gating is a, has a similar idea, but at a more higher level. We can turn off the entire call or the cache. So this is the clock gating is only for the function unit level. The function unit actually have a clock. Um, for the larger component like the cache or the one call, um, it may not have a, you know, a ex external clock. So we can just, uh, um, use the power gating to cut it off. But the idea of these two are the same. One is for the small component, the other one uh, is for the large component. Uh, we can also reduce the voltage. We can use the DVFS. DVSF means we can dynamically control the F here. If we are busy, we have a lot of job to do, we increase this F. Otherwise, when we, are, we, we, we don't have too much job, we can reduce this F. So the frequency can be controlled by decreasing the, or increasing the voltage. When we increase the voltage, the frequency can be increased. If we reduce the voltage, the frequency can be reduced. So when we 
do not have too much application, too many applications, we can reduce the, reduce the voltage. In this way, the transistor runs slower. The, the transistor runs slower means the, the frequency is uh, slow, uh, the smaller. The frequency is not high for the slow transistor. Um, when we become busy again, we can increase the voltage. The transistor will become faster again. The frequency will be increased. And we also have some other technique to reduce the power consumption. And this is a very active research area, in, even in current computer architecture community. Um, so the CPU only is only one component in the computer system. We also have the other components. So you can see actually the disk Uh, which one is the D? The disk consume 4%. The AC-DC converter consume 14%. IO consume 20%. And these components are not more power efficient than the CPU itself. They also consume a lot of power consumption, even larger power consumption. For example, the memory, the DRAM, consume 20%. So the, actually, the CPU only consume 25% of the total system power consumption. We need a more method to reduce the power consumption from the system perspective, which means that we need to reduce the power consumption for all these components. Any question? I had a doubt from previous lecture. Uh, can I ask that? Yes. So in lecture four, um, I can share my screen because I have it pulled up if you want to. Yes, you can try. Uh, I can't share it while you're sharing your screen. Um. Can you try now? Uh, yes. Um, just a second. So about the CMOS power. So when we compute it, only this part is equal to 14.4. This part isn't counted. No, this part is counted. counted. But if we do the math, half into 20 is 10. And 1.2 squared is 1.44. 10 into 1.44 is 14.4. That's 20 milliwatt. Uh, I'm sorry, that's 20 milliamp. Milliamp, you need to multiply 10 to minus 6. You need to use amp multiply volt. So that's that part is a 20 millivolt, milliamp. It's a 20 multiply 10 to minus 6. So it's so, a very, very small. You can directly ignore that. Okay, we can ignore that. That was uh, what I was asking. The reason why I give you this example is that I just want you guys to first unify all the units to the standard unit. For example, nano F to F, milliamp to amp, 1 G hertz to hertz, you need to convert all these unit to some unified standard unit. Okay. Okay, thank you. So please check the uh, cameras. In next lecture, I will cover the review for the midterm. 
So I will I may present maybe twelve or fourteen problems. We only have ten problem in the midterm, which will be similar to the problem I presented in the review. So the review class is very important. I plan to do the review text in review review class in in on Wednesday in next lecture. Make sure you will attend that class. And then um, I will just answer some questions in the next week. Um, on October 5th, we will have the midterm. For the midterm, uh, you can have the internet, you can have the slides, you can have anything you like, but uh, please, Make sure that you submit your uh, PDF or the or the paper online on time. Um, so the requirement is that I'm only sensitive to the time. You can, you know, but during the examination, we just log into this Zoom uh, meeting. If you have any question, you can you can ask. Uh, I will answer. Um, but uh, I will give you maybe one hour. After that one hour, I, I need you to submit the, the paper or the PDF. Uh, you write uh, immediately on time. Any question? If no question, we can stop today. Check the syllabus on Canvas. Thank you very much.